um, today it is my honor and pleasure on behalf of the Biology Society to introduce you to our next speaker, our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Bittu uh, K. Ramarajan. He is currently working as the head of the Department of Psychology and as an associate professor of biology and psychology at Ashoka University, Sonipat. He has received his PhD in neuroscience from Harvard University, studying intrinsic photosensitivity in Salamander retinae. He was then also a DST, Dr. D.S. Kothari postdoctoral fellow at the Center of Ecological Sciences, Indian Institute of Science, where he studied the evolution of neural and behavioral system of communication amongst orthopteran insects in response to ecological constraints. Prior to joining Ashoka University, Dr. Bittu was also an inspired faculty at the Central University of Hyderabad. Dr. Bittu, once again, it is my pleasure and honor to introduce you on behalf of the Biology Society. Over to you. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, hi, Tanmay. Just want to make sure all of you can, can hear me. Uh, so I thought a lot about whether I'd want to give this as sort of a specific talk related to my research interests or whether I should sort of talk more generally. And so I've, I've decided that I'm going to sort of do a little bit of each um, so that uh, the main points that I'm making come through in, um, in the kind of, of uh, research that, uh, that I've done myself, right? So that they're rooted in um, specific examples. And so that it's not sort of a general talk, but something that, that may have also be of specific value in terms of um, understanding the kind of uh, stuff that I do. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, uh, and I hope you can see my slides. Can you confirm, Tanmay, if you can see my slides? Yes, Professor, we can. OK. So um, OK, so what I want to do is to, um, to sort of take you through my work um in terms of this question of technology uh because there's essentially two points that i like to make one is that technology can open doors to asking questions that you that you never thought that you could ask before right uh but at the same time technology runs the risk of really constraining uh, sometimes over constraining um the uh kinds of questions you even think to ask in the first place and uh the goal of my talk is to give you several instances um and examples of how in the course of my own work um so that I'm not making that point more generally, but specifically ways in which I found, um, you know, moving, taking a step back away from technology to be useful and ways that I found taking a step towards technology to be useful. OK. All right. So um, I began uh, my research, uh, you know, um, so, so the work that I sort of uh, did for my PhD um con uh, sort of uh, constituted a very specific system which I'll, I'll actually get into later on uh but it was a system in which we uh examined um the relationship between uh retinal function and retinal physiology uh and at the time that i did this i was largely interested in theoretical biology i didn't particularly want to be doing um anything uh related to um uh you know um uh sort of uh, experiments at all. And so I eventually ended up choosing a lab where um, I was um, effectively doing just that, that you know our experiments were really minimal. And at the same time, they were somewhat technologically advanced at the time. Um, we were studying ganglion cells in the retina, and the retina is sort of a flat tissue on the back, uh, you know, and they sort of line the, the back of the sphere that that's one's eye. And we were just pull retinae out of salamanders. Those were the species that I was working on. We place them on a bed of electrodes. And then on that bed of electrodes, we'd record from uh, up to 64 uh, you know, retinal ganglion cells at a time while essentially playing movies to, uh, the, um, uh, to the system. Now, I could talk about that system in some detail, although it's not something that I work on at all anymore. Uh, so I'm, I'll, I'll briefly mention it in the middle of my talk. But this was an example of, uh, it was a technological advance that my advisor at the time had made. Until that point, we were recording from, um, you know, uh, cells one neuron at a time. Uh, this uh, took forward the possibility of recording from multiple cells at a time. And this was also at a time when, 
the field was moving away from an understanding of what single neurons can do and towards an understanding of what populations of neurons can do. And as it turns out, uh, you know, the experiments were therefore very, very simple. You just place the retina on this bed of electrodes, you shine various, uh, you know, you, you display various visual stimuli directly onto the retina, and then you watch the retina respond. Right. But as you can imagine, a lot of the work that went into analyzing it, like much of our time was not spent doing experiments, but in analyzing the data, trying to make sense of this jumble of activity that we got relative to the stimulus. And so I'll point out that often when one makes technological advan advances like this, uh, you know, what one has to worry about is developing the technical capability to analyze the data that come out and make sense of the data that come out as a result of it, and various ways in which technology has changed or sped up the ways in which we can do some of these things. But for my, um, you know, I wasn't having fun though uh, in my PhD. I found, you know, I didn't like being in the lab all the time. Uh, I found it sort of an extremely boring sort of environment. Um, I wanted to spend more time in the field. I felt like the kinds of things that I was interested in um, as a kid, right, which sort of seeing biological systems all around me, you know, being in sort of very, um, you know, biologically diverse settings, uh, uh, you know, getting interested in, in animal behavior and therefore in animal, in the neuroscience behind that behavior. I felt like all of the steps were before sort of that, that built up my interest in the subject were missing and that I was essentially, and this is, uh, I think, one of the major um, uh, limitations, uh, you know, of working on model systems is that the field sort of converges on a set of model systems to answer, and each model system has been, you know, provides benefits in terms of answering specific kinds of questions and in opening technological doors to certain kinds of investigations that are very powerful. Um, and really the story of what I did after my PhD is the story of my moving away from a model system and then partially moving back towards a uh, you know a particular model system so um uh you know for the technical technological advantages in each and so that that journey um, uh, may help uh, sort of reveal what uh, you know what uh, what sort of technologically is useful and what's not um one of the things that i so what i decided after my phd to do was to work on insect communication um, and, you know, really all I was looking for was, a, uh, uh, you know, I had done my PhD entirely in um, pure neuroscience. Uh, yeah, my presentation is moving yet, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> um, and, um, uh, you know, I wanted to go back to doing sort of lots of behavioral ecology as well, uh, doing a lot more field work. And I wanted to move through the whole process of seeing something interesting in the wild, wanting to figure out what it is, and then figuring that out in the lab rather than walking into a lab with an established model system whose advantages and disadvantages with respect to asking particular questions are known. And for me, that process turned out to be important. So I came back to India, uh, went to the Western Ghats, our sort of one of our, one of our two sort of major biodiversity hotspots, and found a lab that was interested in similar questions. They were doing ecology. They were willing for me to learn ecology as a postdoc, which often you're not, you know, as a postdoc, you're supposed to just hit the ground running and keep cranking out the same stuff you did as a PhD student. Uh, but I wanted to do something new, and I got the chance with um, uh, Professor Roni Balakrishnan at, at the uh, the uh, at the Center for Ecological Sciences in ISC, and we were looking at a very at a quote unquote very simple problem, the question of insect communication and cognition, uh, what's called the co cocktail party problem, and the question of essentially how it is that animals are um, uh, in in the context of um, uh, the Western Ghats the ways in which animals might recognize each other's call, right? And this was very much the kind of uh, problem I wanted to work on as a kid. Um, you might hear an insect in the Western Ghats that produces a sound like this. I'm assuming all of you can hear my, uh, my, my the sound in the video, uh, 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 sort of associated yeah, with my exactly. slides. Yeah. Great, great. So if you have both animals calling together, the first one relatively soft, the second one relatively loud, overlapping spectrally, the second one can actually start to drown out the first one. And we wanted to ask questions of how it is that these uh, animals heard each other. This is now three species calling at the same time, all masking each other. And so we wanted to ask various questions of how uh, you know, communication can be unique in these animals. And the reason that I want to mention this story is because these are really cool systems in which we were able to see various things that you that you often don't get to see in a model system. And one is when you're working with a new system, the animals themselves surprise you, right? So you're not working on a system which is overdetermined. There are, you know, 
500 labs all over the world working on it, you're unlikely to find something that surprises you. And for me, that's part of the joy of doing science, right? It's, it's, it's working on a system where people don't know anything, right? And you're, um, you know, you're seeing things unfold in front of you uh, that you know are being, you know, are not uh, going to, uh, you know, affect the world. I have a, there's a question saying, if you remove the salamander retinas, did the test animals die? Yes, they did. I don't think they had to, but in the procedure that we use, they did. And that was also part of the reason I was somewhat disaffected by this. I'm, I'm interested in models where you can do neuroscience sustainably on an animal. And I, I'll also, uh, that explains also part of my move back towards a model system towards the end. Okay, so uh, I ended up working on this animal, this beautiful cricket um, that produces such a low frequency sound that it's effectively moved away from an extremely high frequency production uh, you know, family. So the, the, it's a part of, uh, uh, you know, a group called bush crickets, which are found in trees. And these animals tend to produce these very high frequency type sounds that you might have heard from the tops of trees at night. And yet we found that this animal had evolved to have extremely low frequency sound production. And we wanted to understand whether it could hear at these frequencies. And so paradoxically, in order to figure this out, we, you know, uh, we had to think of new tools. And so we ended up using a combination of tools that were very, very old uh, and tools that were very, very new, each of which sort of, um, uh, you know, the, the, old, the tools that were old and well understood uh, still lent themselves very well to asking and answering sort of interesting questions. For example, and I'm just going to skip a few, um, uh, you know, slides ahead. Um, you know, we, uh, we CT scanned the animals so that we could get a sense of what the years look like. Again, the animals surprised at us at every stage. I mean, a CT scan is a really old and basic thing to do. Uh, but, um, you know, when we CT scan these years of the animals, and these animals don't have years on their head, they have years on the front legs. And those, are, again, so as I said, here, we're working with a new system, everything that the animal does is like amazing, right? So the years are, are modified mechanoreceptors on the front leg. The, the, they have a hearing organ called the crystal acoustica, which is nearly, uh, which, you know, whose design and whose, uh, the, you know, the structure and function and so on, uh, and tonotopic mass mapping of auditory receptors is almost, uh, you know, identical to the, the human cochlea. Again, by chance, uh, uh, you know, uh, appears to be sort of a convergent example of convergent evolution. And when we scanned these ears, we actually found that they had two tympana instead of one. So we have one eardrum per year. They have two eardrums per year. And in the, again, this animal sort of surprised us in that we found that the two ears were listening to very different things. If we looked at the at different frequencies of sound, it turns out that if you play, uh, you know, uh, sound to the ear, um, they vibrate at different frequencies. Now, again, in order to figure out what the ear was doing, right, we had to use an interesting and again, what seems like a complicated piece of technology called a laser Doppler vibrometer. What does that do? It's an expensive machine because it's obviously sort of high tech. And uh, but all it does is the same thing that you've heard about in school, the Doppler effect. When a train sort of comes closer to you, right, it looks it feels like, um, you know, the whistle is um, becoming lower pitched. And that's because as it's moving towards you, frequencies are in some sense, uh, you know, the, the, the wavelength uh, in some sense uh, gets uh, compressed. Uh, and um, uh, your, the waves themselves get, that get compressed, leading to sort of a, a, a lowered perception of, um, of pitch. Uh, and so we did, the, this employs the same principle. It shoots a laser at the ear. And as the ear moves back and forth, the reflection of the laser back shifts slightly in frequency depending on whether the ear itself is moving away from the laser or towards the laser. So while you play a sound that makes the eardrum vibrate, you watch the eardrum vibrate using this laser Doppler vibrometer, right? And so by, uh, we, we could play different frequencies of sound to the animal, watch the eardrum vibrate, and therefore get a sense of what the eardrum was tuned to, right? Uh, for sounds of equivalent intensity at different frequencies, we found that one of those tympanal membranes was listening to very low frequencies, but not was just not vibrating with the same intensity when sounds of the same intensity of higher frequency were played. And it acted as what we call a low pass filter, listening to low frequency sounds, but not high frequency sounds. Whereas the other tympanal membranes seem to be able to listen at multiple frequencies, at multiple ranges of frequency. 
And, uh, you know, the interesting thing is that this cutoff point is the frequency at which this animal skull is discernible from the rest of the forest skulls. So we found a solution to the cocktail party problem uh, using this very unusual tool, which is largely used by materials engineers, uh, applied to um, animal sculling in the forest. And that sort of indicated that, um, you know, there was this decrease in uh, frequency uh, or, or, or frequency sensitivity. And so one eardrum is basically listening to this uh, animal's same species call and blocking out other sounds in the forest. While, as you can imagine, listening to all sounds in the forest is somewhat useful, the other tympanal membrane seemed to have taken on this task. So we found this very unusual differential partitioning of function between two tympana, two eardrums, within the same year uh, for this organism. Of course, there's a lot more interesting work that could be done on this system. Uh, they produce sound by rubbing their wings against each other. There's a scraper on one end of this wing, and as you can see, a file on the other, and that creaking, cra, 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 that's what, 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 what generates this sound. And so in this system, you know, we were able to sort of um, uh, determine how the, the, the sort of hearing system worked at a, a material level. We were able to do behavioral experiments, which were so simple, right, that you might not even believe, uh, you know, I mean, they, they, they take absolutely no kind of um, um, necessary, uh, you know, uh, technological sort of, um, oops, sorry about that, uh, uh, technological, um, you know, uh, input at all. Um, and, you know, for example, when we did those extremely simple experiments, so we, you have experiments at two ends of the spectrum, technologically complicated and technologically extremely simple, which is just to play the song to the animal and see what the animal, uh, what the what conspecifics do in response. We discovered this sort of very novel multimodal duet, where as the animal hears the song, the animal, instead of moving towards the source of the sound, which is what usually happens in these uh, organisms, would vibrate right the, the entire body out of phase with the song so um this, that's the song and you can kind of see the animal vibrating right and so we have this we have this behavioral analysis that we're thinking was just going to involve a sense of whether the animal can hear the sound localize the sound what features of the sound make the animal localize it and we were expecting again a very uh, simple uh, and very cool uh, you know outcome we find an outcome that's so unusual, uh, and it's unusual precisely because uh, the animal just didn't behave the way most other bush crickets do, and surprised us with what, you know, when we discovered it was the only kind of multimodal duet that had been described, which is, you, you know, the, the, the song is an acoustic song, and the response was a vibrational song. And we were able to also follow the, the duetting partner and realize that the duetting partner was able to pick up such vibration. But again, when we were doing something like this, we decided that we'd deploy our fancy, uh, a simpler version of our fancy laser vibrometer to quantify these vibrations. And so, uh, you know, you can see that here, uh, we use the same laser vibrometer to sort of uh, measure how the, the sort of vibrational uh, signal traveled along the beam where the animal was producing the sound. And we were able to quantify all the temporal precision of this multimodal duet um, uh, and so on and so forth. Okay, uh, and of course, when we looked uh, at the years, the same Doppler vibrometer was, you know, the, the advanced version of this Doppler vibrometer did the same thing, except that it needed to be able to, uh, you know, much, much more expensive model simply because it needed to be able to scan the year at extremely low resolution, right, to watch the membrane sort of vibrate back and forth. Okay, so uh, I'm just going to uh, skip ahead a little bit to introduce you to a couple of uh, other systems uh, that I've worked on. Uh, uh, you know, uh, with respect to this animal. We've also done some uh, neural recordings from these animals. This and again is an example of a technology that, um, that now we have the, the power with which to do, uh, uh, you know, really fancy uh, sort of intracellular recordings with uh, these organisms. And again, the field moved forward um, uh, a lot because of an understanding of how song was produced and heard using these kinds of um, recordings. But in our case, uh, you know, we uh, sort of really uh, enjoyed and followed uh, an approach uh, by, um, uh, you know, um, uh, by, uh, uh, you know, pioneered by somebody named Heiner Roma, uh, uh, whose lab I briefly trained in. Um, and, you know, what he did was actually to sort of walk backwards. 
In the lab, you understand very nicely how the neurons of the animal produce song, how the neurons of the animal hear and interpret auditory features in song. But we had no way to study something like the cocktail party problem, which is something that happens in the wild when you have multiple callers. And if you want to see how an organism's nervous system is, in some sense, pulling out one caller, right, or responding selectively to some callers and not others, which is essentially an attentional problem, quote unquote, for the insect, uh, you need a natural setting. And so they actually walked back the process to, to technology that we've had for 60, 70 years to build a sort of really tiny all-in-one amplifier, digitizer, um, and you know, electrophysiological recorder, which did not have to be used in the lab on an air table, but which could actually be handheld. And so you could actually take the insect into the wild, record from the insect while the insect is listening to songs in the wild. Uh, and this really cool technique uh, pioneered uh, by Heiner Roma gave us insight, gave at least um, the, the community insights into how um, uh, you know, uh, sound could be heard based on a technological simplification rather than something that was technologically more complicated. And these are some sample results of that. And there are other questions that we look at with respect to how predators are heard and so on. Uh, you know, uh, some of these uh, recordings that we actually did with their setup uh, showed uh, sort of um, that our cricket, the same cricket that I've shown you results from before, was uh, you know, while it's responding on the one hand, uh, probably using that anterior tympanal, tympanal membrane to hear the same species low frequency call, it's also the, the you know, the, the, it's also listening at the same time very sharply. In fact, the largest neuron in the ascending um, nerve um, of this animal, the nerve going from the ears uh, connection in the, in sort of a little knot of neurons called the prothoracic ganglion to the brain, that ascending nerve uh, seem to, uh, you know, the largest neuron that seemed to primarily be responding to predatory high frequency bat calls, uh, rather than, um, uh, you know, uh, so uh, sort of pre preferentially tuned to that as is commonly seen in bush crickets. Okay, so um, I'm going to, uh, again, skip ahead for, uh, for, uh, you know, lack of time to just say that, um, you know, uh, therefore, we've often found that in something like this, which is the simplest kind of system that, um, this is the, an example of the system that I worked on in my PhD, where you have a very simple system, a retina, photoreceptors, two layers of processing cells, and we would place, our, you know, we, we would shine light on the photoreceptors and we would place our recording system over here. Um, we would find that in, uh, you know, whether it was for systems like this or systems uh, in uh, auditory recognition or the, the systems that I'm going to introduce you to now, uh, where we're looking at how numerical cognition happens uh, in fish, that a combination of, a, of new uh, and interesting questions that are not limited by the technological means that one already sort of possesses um, uh, are used in combination with taking whatever technologies are available to open doors that otherwise might seem closed, um, you know, that those have shone a lot of light. With respect to numerical cognition in particular, I'd like to sort of point out that a lot of the really, really cool results, you know, numerical cognition, the, the ways in which we do maths, right? Uh, that's an example of a question that's, uh, that we've had the technological tools to answer since forever, right? These are really easy experiments that you could do here, that you could do anywhere in the world. And I started thinking about doing these kinds of experiments actually when I, so remember my journey is also unusual. I did a PhD at Harvard. I then came back to the, uh, the Indian Institute of Science. And then I really wanted to be in a publicly accessible public university. So I, I was at the University of Hyderabad, uh, where initially when I went in, I had no uh, equipment of my own and a colleague really sort of supported me um, in accessing the equipment in their lab. But at this stage, I was thinking, you know, we can, I can, you know, I'll, I'll get a grant, you know, we'll catch up to the kinds of things that the, that the world is doing, the kinds of technologies that the world is using to shine light on new questions. But when one is, you know, when one's going to be on the losing side of that battle, right? So people are asking, uh, you know, um, complex questions with advanced technology. If one's trying to sort of, um, uh, you know, be at that same cutting edge, if one's entire scientific work is premised at being on that cutting edge, um, then often if we're doing what I'd vaguely call third world science, but that, that, that I'd specifically say is science in places where, uh, which are not the places where sort of the, the, many of these technologies are primarily manufactured. The question is, what should one's approach be? 
and i think the answer is that one should always play uh, you know one can one should one should not uh, sort of give up on uh, being competitive with respect to um, uh, you know technologies that are cutting edge uh, but it's important also to play to the strengths of a location and so what are some of the strengths of this location well i think many of us who read uh, you know 40 year old 50 year old papers in science find that they work that that a lot of our basic work on understanding the nuts and bolts of systems worked not on complicated for example neural systems such as mice and um, and monkeys but on really really sim simple systems like aplasia and so on um, we find that many of those experiments were very, very low in, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the technological requirements uh, that they had, but because there was no sense of sort of, this is the cool field, this is the cool technology to use, people were a lot more imaginative about the kinds of questions they asked. And so to this day, some of the most interesting work being done now involves people asking interesting questions that are not being asked by people who are going into labs where a standard model of organism is being worked on to understand a particular and complicated kind of behavior, but just asking questions about behaviors that have not been probed uh, before. And there's been a flourishing of sort of recent and really exciting work on, uh, on numerical perception, which I'd like to share. Um, so some of these have, have shown up really sort of fantastic results. Again, very simple technology. Um, and uh, you know the kind of stuff that you can really very easily, um, and this was my goal at the time, to, to find experimental work that undergraduates could really easily work on without a lot of training. Um, and I found that this is a really, really nice system in which to do this. So um, you know, uh, uh, in this case, bees are being trained to recognize either the larger or the smaller set among um, you know, a, a set of objects that are presented to them. And very, very cool work suggesting that honeybees are actually able to outperform several vertebrates um, and, uh, you know, um, some very, very young humans, uh, uh, possibly, uh, with, you know, te the testing paradigm really being the, the difficulty in terms of implementing much of this, um, with respect to being able to order uh, and choose between uh, the sort of uh, size of a set, uh, ranging from numbers sort of one to six, um, and bees were also sort of uh, just demonstrated, and this was very recent work a couple of years ago, uh, spontaneous choice if they were trained on picking the lower number of uh, out of two numbers presented to them. So say they were trained to land on two squares instead of four. Then when they were spontaneously shown empty sets, um, they would land on the emptier of these two uh, sets, suggesting that there was a, a sort of spontaneous understanding of zero as being less than any of these other numbers. Very, very cool stuff. Again, very, very cool stuff. Uh, work done actually in the 80s, but really not followed up on now simply because it's one of those buried papers which has not been um, sort of understood or, or, or really sort of taken forward um, as much as it could have, um, where rats were trained to um, indicate what they thought a number was. So again, experiments that don't require any technology. Uh, you ask a rat to press uh, in this version of the experiment uh, or, or let's just pick this because it's easier, yeah, with duration control for pick an experiment where they hear two tones, uh, you know, in that case, press a lever on the left, and if they hear eight tones, press a lever on the right. So this is the training paradigm. Uh, in the context of this version of the experiment, it's, it's the same number of tones, four, but uh, in this case, lasting for two seconds versus eight seconds to see whether rats are able to be trained on understanding kind of the duration of time, something that's of interest to us when we're understanding auditory perception as well in crickets, uh, or whether they can understand the number of pulses they heard even when the same time, when, when both involve the same time. So these are two separate experiments, but in either case, the rats were able to learn the experiment. And once they performed well, these experimenters did a really, really uh, cool thing of trying to see what they thought of intermediate durations or intermediate um, numbers of pulses. And so I'll just take this example forward because number of pulses is, is perhaps more, more relevant to what we'd, we'd like to say. Um, and they found essentially, perhaps I shouldn't give this away, that when you, when you ask the animal, when, when you play three tones and you see whether the animal seems to, spont to sort of spontaneously understand that and choose the left lever over the right lever, it turned out that the animals unsurprisingly mapped this stimulus to that and picked the left lever. These are two alternative first choice experiments. That is the animal has to do one of the two things, press the left lever or the right lever if it wants a reward. If the animal was played six 
pulses, um, it was more likely to press the right lever than the left. If the animal heard five pulses, remember five is the numerical intermediate between two and eight, right? Two plus three is five, five plus three is eight. Paradoxically, the animal was more likely to think of five as eight. So it, it, more, it pressed, these animals on average, uh, average together, press the right lever more than the left when they heard five pulses. But when they heard four pulses, which is the logarithmic intermediate between two and eight, they were equally likely to press the left and right. Um, you know, um, uh, so the, the probability of 0.5 of pressing the left and right levers corresponded to hearing four pulses. And this is very interesting because it's extremely revealing of something that, uh, you know, was, is really sort of mind blowing if you think about it, which is that, an, you know, uh, which is that a lot of what we think of as standard um, is very specific to both the testing procedures that we've gotten used to, the, the technological frameworks that we've gotten used to, and the training paradigms that we've gotten used to. So training paradigms in humans for numerical cognition involve teaching on a, a sort of um, a number line, right, with numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then later on, teaching the idea of a log scale, the idea of 10, 100, 1000, and so on, uh, of multiplicatives as being on a log scale. Despite the fact that we know that, um, uh, you know, that Weber's law and sort of the, the perception of quantities as a fixed fraction of the background um, is uh, something that both our visual systems do and that all sensory systems do. And we now know that some numerical cognition systems also work that way. So in this context, perception of four is intermediate between two and eight is something that corresponds to a multiplicative of, or, or, or log scale perception by these rats and suggests that these rats were intuitively sensing on a log scale rather than on a linear number scale. Okay, and this is the equivalent of the, of uh, Weber's law with respect to vision. The ratio between, you know, if if you raise the background of light from say, uh, and these are, you know, um, what you perceive as an increase in sound, so either an increase in pitch or an increase in loudness in sound, those are actually measured on log scales. So decibels, which is how you perceive loudness, these are log scales. They're not linear scales. Um, uh, likewise, uh, you know, when you hear frequencies as twice as uh, you know, um, as sort of one note up. So between C and, you know, if you're, uh, if you're doing Sare Gamma or ABCD on a scale, right, these are multiples of each other, not linear steps on a linear scale. And so uh, a lot of our sensory perception, and likewise with light, as light intensity goes up, what you perceive as a just noticeable difference in light in intensity is of is a multiplicative fraction of the background, right? And so, um, these then really change the possibilities for how you might uh, understand in a, you know numerical cognition that isn't delimited by the ways in which uh, you know a standard mathematics education occurs um, how that what that might look like likewise we've had the technology to do a lot of experiments uh, for years that have not been done simply because uh, one thinks that these are too simple, but it took until 2007 with all of the testing tools that we had for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for researchers to attempt what you might think is an extremely simple experiment. And the question is, why wasn't it done earlier, right? Is it because, um, uh, you know, sometimes some ideas take years uh, to be even considered, even when long after they're technologically feasible? So in this case, uh, researchers decided to look at, um, uh, you know, disparities in, uh, you know, sort of standard um, intelligence testing, uh, which can be critiqued in and of itself. Um, so, uh, you know, intelligence testing, uh, you know, is interesting. It reveals that, you know, it, it, it looks like every intelligent uh, generation is more intelligent than the previous one. This is something called the, the Flynn effect. And it uh, turns out that this is also because of um, ways in which over time uh, communities get accustomed to, uh, you know, this particular form of testing. And that plays a strong role in how people perform on these tests, unsurprisingly, which is perhaps something that all of us know across privilege, that really your familiarity with the testing paradigm may have more to do with how you perform on it than something, you know, deemed supposedly innate, such as um, intelligence. Um, Likewise, you know, a hundred years ago, um, with greater disparities between uh, men and women, men outperformed women on standard IQ tests. And now that gap has, you know, narrowed to be statistically insignificant, except for one component, and that was the spatial skills, uh, spatial, um, you know, uh, rotation type tasks, which were vaguely associated with mathematical ability. 
Uh, and these these uh, spatial rotation tasks, for example, are of this kind. You might have seen them if you've ever done uh, something like an IQ test. And uh, you know, in these uh, skills, one would find that men routinely outperformed women. And yet it took till 2007 for researchers to try a very simple experiment. And that experiment was repeating these tests on men and women, bef uh, you know, both uh, doing a test before and after a training period consisting just of a video game rotating things in space. And it turns out that video games, just video game training itself, reduced to statistically insignificant differences and improved really the, the, the performance of both men and women with the difference between them uh, becoming statistically uh, insignificant um, if it was if they were trained on action video games. And this is an example of something where, um, you know, a, 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 you know, a bias that's that's existed for as long as we've uh, uh, as long as we've uh, known in the field that men are better than women at spatial skills gets busted apart by a study in 2007, which just involves eight hours of training on a video game, right? And it doesn't even account for years and years of differential access and differential encouragement to play games, right, between men and women, even if um, they're otherwise enrolled in similar schools. So um, lots of interesting experiments, uh, you know, uh, suggesting that really while technology might have moved, often what takes longer to move is, is mindsets, right? The idea that you can ask these kinds of questions and that you can, um, uh, you know, attempt these kinds of interventions. So likewise, we do some of our numerical cognition work in very, very simple circumstances. Here's an example of, and, and you know, we had to even simplify further when the lockdown happened and people weren't able to access labs anymore. So for example, here is this extremely simple experiment, which is so easy for students to do that we're now thinking of making this a citizen science experiment where anybody can do this at home. In fact, if you have a dog at home or a dog around you in a campus, uh, any dog, <laughs> let us know. You can join our numerical cognition experiments on dogs. And in this case, these dogs are, and of course, one has to follow the scientific process very carefully. You know, these dogs are being trained on associating these visual numerical symbols with the number of items of food that they're going to get. And of course, we randomize the position of these. We make sure that the animals get no other cues. These are all things that, so we, wherever one works, one still has to set it up like a lab. Um, but one can do this, um, you know, in any sort of closed room. <laughs> as long as one removes any sort of landmarks and cues and so on that are directional. And, uh, you know, uh, these animals were then trained. And over time, as you can see, they learned to sort of um, prefer uh, the, the, the sort of two uh, sort of, uh, the, you know, package number two, because, because it would have more items of food. Uh, so that's an example, again, of extreme technological simplicity, which is getting at the same kinds of answers that we're also getting at with respect to much more complicated technologies. So, for example, another system that we've started to work on in is zebrafish. And again, the reason we're interested in working on zebrafish is because they're a standard model system. And there are some things we can do with zebrafish that we can't do with dogs. And likewise, things with dogs that we can't do with, with, with zebrafish. Um, so with zebrafish, we're doing similar kinds of experiments in seeing whether they can make choices between the number of fish that they um, that they show with. And uh, this is an example of um, this fish sort of moving around and showing more with, um, uh, you know, uh, in this case, uh, a larger number of fish, but you know, those results vary from fish to fish. And we can use sort of now, uh, you know, complicated and interesting sort of machine learning algorithms just to track the ways in which these fish move. So this is then a machine learning algorithm where it's an artificial neural network that has learned uh, what a fish is. Uh, from hours of training data, and based on that information, can track the fish automatically as it moves, so that we can get automated trajectories of how the fish moves. Um, and again, this is complicated technology thrown at a simpler system, but enables us to then study more complicated responses in these fish, uh, because we're not able to see the same kinds of clear-cut responses that we see in them uh, as we see in dogs. And what's the eventual goal? It's to collaborate with people who are doing, uh, you know, really the highest uh, uh, tech version of what we were doing in my PhD, where we were, you know, recording from 20, you know, 64 neurons from a retina, uh, which is why limit oneself to 64. Uh, this is an example of a zebrafish brain being um, uh, viewed uh, while the zebrafish is awake, alive, and behaving, uh, but immobilized. Uh, just the head is immobilized, the tail is not. Um, and as the fish views the stimulus, this is data from Freud and Gert's lab, you'll see, uh, you know, uh, colors, right, or dyes lighting up. 
And this is because all of these neurons encode a calcium indicator. So as calcium enters the cell during the cell's firing, they make, uh, they, they cause fluorescence in the calcium indicator. And here now you have, of course, the technological problem of interpreting, uh, you know, the activity of um, uh, thousands and thousands of neurons while the fish is behaving. Uh, but uh, therefore, if you want to sort of look for, uh, you know, and, and this is the stimulus that they're responding to, if you want to look for, um, you know, what kinds of neurons might be involved in counting uh, activity, we might eventually want to take um, these um, the work that we've, uh, you know, that we've gotten at from very simple behavioral experiments that can be done anywhere to, um, you know, collaborators who can look at this with more complicated tools. And of course, now you have even other kinds of complicated tools, such as what's called optogenetics, where you can uncage, um, you know, ion channel activity uh, using a laser and thereby um, uh, manipulate neurons into firing and then see the effect on behavior, mm -hmm. thereby proving causal effects. Okay, so I'm almost done here. I mean, I'm just gonna, uh, you know, uh, thank funding sources, the dogs who participated in our um, experiments and um, uh, all the, the students in my lab. So uh, I will end with that for now uh, and take questions. Okay, I see there are already a lot of questions in the chat box. Um, yeah, Professor, if you would yeah. like me to read them out for you, um, I'm okay with that as well. So whatever sure. you prefer. Um, yes. So, oh, or I, can, I can read them out as well. That's, 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 that's fine. No worries. All right. Sure. sure. Okay. So Suranjana uh, Gupta says, and of course, if any of you would like to ask me directly yourself, that's fine. Feel free to unmute, unmute yourself and, and ask. Suranjana, do you want to ask your question? Uh, okay. So yeah, go good, e good evening. Um, yeah. Good evening. The talk was very fascinating. So my question actually came into the uh, was with respect to the initial slides where you said that you know you checked the frequency of the two uh, your uh, membranes yeah and you found that the same sound is perceived differently by the two ears and I was just wondering what could yes I was just wondering what what could be the biological uh, significance or implication of having such a setup done I mean yeah how would I mean, it benefit or uh, yeah, good question. Uh, you know, uh, we know that, so remember that they have two ears and two tympana per year. In most crickets and bush crickets, one tympanum is kind of a dud tympanum. It doesn't work, right? It doesn't respond. It doesn't move in response to sound while the other one does. And this is an example, a rare example of an animal where both tympana are functional and where one of the function, one of those tympana, you know, um, um, you know, is, uh, is uh, differentially tuned. Now, of course, uh -huh. we still don't understand how the differential tuning is then processed by neurons, which are in the auditory canal. So these two tympana both uh, are part of the same auditory canal, right? So they're in some sense spatially segregating uh, different frequencies, uh, but not I mean, the final pool of neurons is the same, right? Um, the sounds. So we don't, well, until we understand that functional connectivity, we're not going to know uh, the functional significance of this arrangement. But of course, you can imagine that segregating, um, you know, conspecific sounds from other sounds helps with what's called, what's called the cocktail um, party problem. In fact, uh, the next question is about the cocktail party problem. And I, I mean, I'm happy for the next person to also ask this separately. But the cocktail party problem is the problem uh, not of uh, auditory dis dis disorientation after getting drunk, but the problem that I introduced in the first slide, right, of when you have several different callers, like you would at a party uh, or a cocktail party, you know, the, the cocktail is incidental to the fact that it's a party with lots of people. And, you know, in an Indian context, perhaps a better example is when you're in a crowded metro or when you're in, you know, <laughs> a CP and there's lots of sound around you. How is it that you're able to pick out one source of sound? We think of this as being very simple because our brains do this effortlessly. But it's the equivalent of, you know, thousands of people banging on a drum you're having your hand to that drum and that's all the information you have about the speakers in the world remember the brains encased in bone it's not able to you know it's not able to make out different sources of sound and so you just have one drum's input and from that you're you know making meaning out of the things i'm saying you're discerning me from other speakers so it's a very, very complicated calculation that's being drawn, done. And you can imagine that having two different drums would be extremely useful. Uh, although we don't know if it's actually 
something that the animal's using until we investigate this con functional con connectivity. So in fact, what we might think is that given that most of these second eardrums are, are, are dud eardrums, that they, that, that they look like eardrums, but they don't function, we actually think possibly that this might, you know, that, you know, in some of these systems, you might have these two eardrums uh, to have evolved from lineages with, I mean, certainly they've evolved from lineages with single eardrums. And this may just be a duplication, a functional duplicate, uh, you know, a, a duplication of structure without functional duplication, but then it throws up two eardrums, which uh, if further mutations render these functionally distinct can confer possible advantages, right? Okay, uh, but certainly if you would like to ans ask more questions, uh, you know, more questions or elaborate on that one, feel, feel free. Um, meanwhile, yeah, I, I, I had just one question. Yeah, go ahead. All right, so uh, you said that uh, salamanders have like two tympani uh, per ear, right? So they have effectively crickets. four of them, right? No, so this is sorry, just work in insects, yeah, not in salamanders. Sorry, sorry, cricket, yeah. My, salamanders my bad, is crickets, right? Yeah. Sorry, sorry, yeah, I, I, got, yeah. I got mixed up. So, uh, uh, like, suppose we play them something that, that humans usually listen to, like, so suppose it's like jazz music or like opera. So will they perceive that differently as well? Here's the problem. We don't, we're not able to tell what they can perceive. In general, I can't tell what another living being perceives unless we seem to share something like language and they're able to communicate with me. Um, so, uh, you know, so, so this is why it's very hard to answer the question of what they experience, right? Will, will their neurons respond to it? Certainly, the way that they might respond to other sounds. Um, would it have functional significance in the same way that, you know, a love song from a fellow uh, member of the same species does? Possibly not. We don't know. If you slow down, actually, a cricket song in time, it actually sounds a lot like choral music, like <laughs> orchestral music. Uh, so this may happen the other way around. We may find slowed down cricket sounds extremely, and even, even non-slowed down cricket songs to be extremely musical. But it's hard for us to answer the question the other way around. And this is an example of one of many questions where we just not able to answer them in, in many animal systems based on the limitations of what we can discern about animal intelligence. But it's important, I think, with the bee, the bee work and several other examples of uh, work really show us that we shouldn't make the mistake of underestimating animal intelligence just because we haven't gotten to the place where we're really even uh, able to comprehend what animals might be experiencing. Uh, and for that matter, so, non-animal uh, non intelligence. So do you think we'll ever be able to answer these, these sorts of questions with advancements in machine learning and uh, neural networks? Yeah, I mean, good question. So, uh, you know, so for example, we're using uh, machine learning to look at uh, the, the communication patterns of animals like bats, where, you know, you hear a lot of chirping and shrieking, but you have no idea what's going on. So hours and hours, so some people um, have actually um, pioneered the use of machine learning to make sense of these. So they just take hours and hours of video and audio footage of animal communication and then try and find long-term patterns between types of auditory communication and the, the visual ecological context for, for when those sounds are produced, the producing kind of the average video of what happened when an animal produced a certain sound to see what different sounds might mean. Uh, so yes, some of these questions will be answered of what animals are thinking will be answered that way. Some other questions, as I said, are answered through really good old fashioned, um, you know, animal behavior work. So for example, uh, you know, uh, recent work that has really uh, over the last, I think, several, several decades, actually, but, but relatively recent work looking at new model systems, right? So if you just continue to look at C. elegans, Drosophila, zebrafish, you know, mice and monkeys, you're missing out on all kinds of organisms where you might get unusual windows into what the animal's thinking. So of course, with dogs, uh, humans and dogs have uh, sort of levels of communication that uh, you know, many humans prefer over communicating with other humans, uh, but uh, but also you know um, uh, you know uh, with years of sort of, of of living together, possibly we think we know what dogs are thinking, and we can of course uh, come come up with tests for that. Um, and new model organisms with good old fashioned low tech behavioral work, people have now found that there are actually organisms that can be trained to speak English, right? So uh, for example. Uh, or really any language, um, uh, presumably, uh, but, you know, African gray parrots, right? So possibly you train an animal to speak a language and then you might be able to ask the animal these kinds of questions. Um, again, low tech work, but work that has then blasted open a possibility that all of our technology heavy model systems didn't. Okay, Bandhan, you had a question? Hi, Dr. Bittu. So I had uh, two questions. One is, uh, so when you were telling about uh, the low uh, the bandpass filters for the uh, different membranes, uh, so those the 
insects are controlling consciously or it is like automatically happening based on the context whether it is for a mating call or uh, whether the insect is uh, looking for predator, uh, predators so how does that happen uh so um you're asking I, I couldn't hear very well so you're asking that you know whether what that what those calls are for no no uh, so uh, how those uh, various filters work like uh, do the insect controls that uh, like consciously or is, is it a conscious a conscious decision or it just happens right so if you think about what consciousness itself is consciousness is one of those things that you report to me right like i ask you did you hear what i said and you say yes i'm i can produce sounds or you know or even visual stimuli which are very brief and then i can ask you did you see them and you may say you didn't see them even though i did flash them up, you know at you so um you know consciousness is something that that is always asked and answered so it's one of those it's an, it's another one of those questions that you that we're not going to get at with animals where you don't you don't have a language associated with the animals so now in fact you can do all kinds of interesting work of this kind with with african gray parrots because a good old fashioned behavioral biologist used zero technology kind of uh, work to open up a new model system where you can you can train the parrot to say i see things or i don't see things in fact they can do much more complicated things than that and then you can study conscious awareness in this parrot by asking did you see the stimulus yes did you not see the stimulus no and of course as you can see with the rats also you can train them to press levers when they you know do and do not see things and you know you can do this with monkeys as well um uh you know but of course you can do more complicated things in terms of assessing uh, conscious perception in uh in these african gray parrots uh, as an example so um so we don't know whether this is something they can consciously change but we do know that you know part of what we think of as human perception and conscious perception is attention and we know that the very act of even selecting or you know of neural systems amplifying some signals over others is an attentional you know act right it's the is the act of taking several sources of information and, and and detecting some of these selectively as features and that's something that's shared in common with several neural systems so depending on how you define consciousness if you're defining it as nothing more than sort of attentional kind of uh, perception or selectivity then um uh, we certainly know that neurons that some there's a neuron called the omega neuron for example in the cricket that does uh, seem to selectively listen to the loudest kind of nearby same species song over and you know you're playing all of these sounds but the neuron only responds to that sound and not to other sounds uh right um so that's an example of an uh, attentional filter uh but the the filters that we found the mechanical filters in the ear we think are just mechanical right they're not we think they're not changed over time although we haven't investigated whether it is um but we we what what we're interested in is looking at how neural information is you know how neurons extract information from uh that sound stimulus um you also asked yeah, a question so, about interference noise right yeah so before that uh, so i had a follow up so since yeah. you mentioned about uh, the parrot uh, so we can teach them uh, uh, like a particular language and we can communicate with them so uh, like uh, mainly with the primates also we used to uh, like i recall an article that i read a few months back so there they were discussing that uh, so we are teaching uh, various uh, species our language like we are making them communicate with us but we are not doing the other way around we are not uh trying to learn their uh, language which they do and like uh, how much work is uh, going on in that direction um well i mean yeah there, there's there's a lot of work in that direction both uh in humans and in non-human systems uh uh you know um perhaps you know some some really cool studies uh, uh, you know systems in which this is being studied are kind of song producing bird systems so these insects don't learn song over time right these are just sort of we think that they're just sort of so these are hardwired sound productions although of course there there's there's some flexibility in when they start calling and end calling obviously because they don't call i mean they call almost every day at, at night but you know they'll stop calling if they you know if, they, if there's a lot of light they'll stop calling if um, you know so so there's certainly there's there's um, when to begin certainly is under a flexible control uh but you know uh, songbirds uh, zebra finches and so on learn song and there there are nice model system in which some of these questions of how how creative song is produced how song learning happens how and there you know uh, that uh, that kind of thing is done uh which, which sort of have some bearing perhaps on understanding language uh in non-human systems but within humans certainly this range of questions the full range of questions that you're asking uh is being asked and, and answered yeah okay 
so uh, the second question was uh, so uh, when you were doing those laser beam studies so uh, there would be much a noise of like maybe disturbance because that uh, the insect itself was moving or maybe some other thing so how yeah, yeah. the baseline yeah, I mean, the baseline was established just that way, right? You have the insect move around, you look at what, what the baseline fluctuations are, and we are lucky that the insect's vibrational signal was large enough that it dwarfed. I mean, there was barely anything that we even noticed when the insects were walking around. But when okay. they grip the branch and vibrate in that whole body way, it generates a vibrational signal which is remarkable. Like, if you use a, a branch of uniform diameter, that signal travels up to four meters away on that branch, and we haven't even tried larger branches than that. But if the branch is part of a tree and there's branching, then it attenuates. And that attenuation also then provides directional information for the partner who's trying to lo localize them. Right? So okay. in, at every fork, you can figure out where the sound's coming from because it'll be stronger there than on the, on the other branch and so on. Yeah, very cool Good. system. Uh, yeah. OK, Manan, you had some questions. Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, I had a question like, what is the general um um a, a general solution to cocktail party problem in salamanders like what are the attention mechanisms that generally happen there like like right. you mentioned that omega 3 new uh, omega 3 neuron i guess that uh, yeah, on this omega point, neuron, yeah 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 so uh, you know there are several solutions to the cocktail party problem one solution our insect had just explored in some sense on its own right i mean it had found one solution which is to call at such a low frequency that in its surrounding uh, zone there are very few i mean bush crickets are largely calling at very very high frequencies and this animal is one of the lowest frequency callers in the forest so you see we see that this animal has explored very low frequencies in kind of evolutionary acoustic space that's one solution to the cocktail party problem is to just broadcast a signal you know so it's like the problem of kind of radios right you, you just use a signal that's uncrowded that's one example of a so you can solutions can be found in call transmission in call sort of production space. And of course, the omega neurons, an example of something that can, uh, you know, uh, that can hear calls, right? So that 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 can be selective towards uh, multiple calls that are heard at the same time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we're, we're hoping that as we work on more and more insects, that we learn more ways that neural circuitry can do this kind of recognition. And, you know, the ways in which we've understood learning the, the fundamental basis of what neuronal learning constitutes, all of these have largely been done in very, very simple uh, model organisms of the kind that we continue, that we largely don't, you know, very, very few people continue to work on those systems, despite the fact that these simple systems have yielded an understanding of how complicated neuronal, you know, um, what we think of as complicated things can actually be done at very simple sort of, uh, at a very simple sort of two neuron, three neuron sort of um, level. And, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think that, you know, with once, once you're dealing with billions of neurons, as you are when you're dealing with a cortex, um, the, there's just, you know, some, you know, neurons in the human brain have, on average, you know, thousands of, uh, a thousand connections, right, with other neurons. Mm -hmm. And so that connectivity is incredibly complicated. It's, I'm glad people are working on it, but it poses a lot of difficulties to, um, to try and understand functionality. Uh, which we continue to, to largely understand when we're doing single neuron recordings. Um, so understanding how circuits can extract complicated information in simple systems, I think, continues to be very useful in theoretically understanding how, uh, you know, area, very disparate areas of the brain, um, which uh, may be involved in sort of handling different aspects of, um, fe you know, either feature extraction or uh, signal processing, um, how they may sequentially sort of... Uh, uh, how they, how, you know, just, just opening our minds to ways in which they might sequentially extract information from each other. So, um, yeah, so there are lots of interesting models of uh, song recognition, you know, song selection, um, song production, and so on that, that we're continuing to be interested in. You've asked if crickets can perceive timbre, right, of a tone. Um, we don't know. We certainly know that humans can. Um, we've, uh, ex we've tried various experiments to see um, uh, the part of the problem of whether they can perceive it or not is the question of what your readout is. And now that we have this really nice readout where these animals vibrate when they hear a sound, you may not get a sense of whether they can or cannot perceive two things which effectively have the same outcome. So, for example, we've tried generating artificial calls and comparing those to natural calls to see if there's something in the natural call that um, 
is more attractive than the artificial call. We find that these animals show equivalent amounts of sort of a rough, you know, indistinguishable amounts of excitement, that is to say, vibration in response to the artificial calls than to the natural calls. Um, but it's possible that they can still tell them apart, but then chalta hai, you know what I mean? So so, um, so that particular system doesn't tell us whether crickets can perceive the difference between the artificial and the natural call. Um, but um, but it's possible that, that, that with other systems, uh, you might see this uh, and you might see a preference for um, you know aspects of the natural call that are that are more than and so 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 what you're what you're really looking for and you're always limited by is the response variable of the organism and so if the response variable is not is not sensitive to um the, you know the timbre of the call you just don't know whether it's something that's being perceived and neglected or not being perceived at all thank you sir so, Dr. Mitto, I think uh, with that, we come to the end of the questions, at least in the chat box. Yeah. So, um, we're just about to wrap up, but may I ask a last question before we Please leave? Please do. Yeah. So, um, Professor, I wanted to understand. So, given that most of the research papers published in science um, come from universities in the so called developed world. Yeah. Um, and these also therefore have uh, access to uh, better technology. How do you think that this impacts sciences in the developing world, which read these papers and they, they, they know that they've made use of these technologies, but these technologies cannot be used so freely in, in, in the parts of the developing world. So how do you think that uh, impacts the science of the developing world? Yeah, as I said, I think that if science in the developing world is entirely trying to use these technologies which are unfairly distributed across the world due to colonial histories, um, and of course unfairly developed, distributed even within our country based on uh, various hierarchies of caste and class and so on within uh, the country, um, that uh, you know, you're, you're always going to see that this is an extremely unequal, inaccessible sort of effort. Uh, given that though, the question is what strategy does one want to use? And as I said, I think it's always important to play to your strengths. Remember that all of the understandings of sort of fundamentally new model systems, which can open doors to asking questions, uh, they are largely found while looking at diverse model organisms and not the standard five or six model organisms in labs. Um, those are, so I always advocate working on one of each, right? Work on one model system, which gives you genetic tools and, and so on that you can use if you'd like to go in that direction with the question, but always also explore interesting new model organisms, right? I mean, that's part of the fun of, of doing science. And, um, you know, and it's also fun to work in systems like these crickets where you just, you know, that no, you know, very few other people are working on these same kinds of questions. And so, you know, you feel that attachment with the system and, uh, and surprises from the system, right? Which is what you hope for in science, you hope to, to come across cool new things. If you're working on a system that you know, 500 people are working on, you, you're just not getting that from it. So I think that the strengths that, and you, and you know, most of these people who are looking for such model systems go on field trips to our parts of the world, right? So they'll come to India for two weeks, they'll go to you know, Latin America for two weeks, looking for these organisms, and we're living next to them, right? So um, often science in India sort of has this drive to be extremely technological and that some of it is just a chip on our shoulders, right? This is not something that we have access to, so we try to make it as tech heavy as possible. And we try to compensate instead of playing to our strengths, which are we have all these really cool model organisms. Let's ask some simple questions, right? Uh, but questions that have far reaching significance uh, using some of these model systems. I mean, zebrafish is used around the world and it's found wild in India, right? This is also part of the reason that I chose zebrafish from among these organisms, because we can ask ecologically relevant questions here that people can't do in other contexts. So I think it's important always to play to our local strengths. And in our case, biodiversity is a major strength that we have, as is the strength of, uh, you know, uh, in many ways, at least my training, uh, didn't have, you know, well, you know when I was uh, uh, in school in India, I was accessing ancient textbooks from the British Council Library. Okay, so these are like textbooks that were written in the 50s and 60s, right? I had no access to the kind of science that's going on in the world. We continue to have most science hidden behind paywalls. You can't even read papers for the most part, if it weren't for Sci-Hub, um, you know, um, uh, that tell you what's going on in science around the world. So um, some of the strengths are also the, the kinds of scientific approaches that were used 60 years ago were less technology limited, right? It wasn't 
here are the five kinds of model organisms, here are the questions you can ask in them, right? It was less handed to you and more what, which of all of the, you know, um, uh, you know, thousands of possible organisms that I can work on, would I like to work on, right? And so there was a lot more, I think, uh, wonder, a lot more basic questions being asked, which were not kind of, this is what people work on, I have to pick one of them, right? But just what do I want to work on? Sort of, you know, what, what's fun for me, right? Those, those, were the, those, were that, those were the approaches that informed science 60 years ago. And I think our strengths are a possible grounding in those classical approaches that uh, other people don't get when they are exposed to this very sort of technologically driven, but therefore uh, question-wise limited um, set of possible uh, ways in which research is done. So I do think it's important to play to our strengths. Thank you so much, uh, Thank you. Dr. Bittu. And I think Bandhan has raised his hand. Um, yeah, so I have just, over to Bandhan. I have one very, uh, very uh, general uh, question. So with yeah. the human gene project or the connectome project as they're advancing, so uh, like how long, uh, like how much more uh, time period do you think it will take to know it, know it all? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions that, that, that people have raised about the Connectome project. So, of course, the Genome Project is, is done with respect to humans. We're going to get more data. Uh, after For a long time, there was this question of whether it was as useful to have a full, you know, human genome sequenced as, as it was imagined. Uh, so, perhaps we've seen the usefulness of the Genome Project. The Connectome Project is going to be harder. A lot of people saying, you know, you have organisms like C. elegans where we know the entire connectome because it's like just, you know, three or two neurons. So we know the entire connectome and yet there's a lot of functionality that we don't understand. And the question is with billions of neurons, when you, when you, when you look at the connectome of a human brain, you're going to get a very sort of individual specific picture. And it, you know, it may just be very large amount of data to try and process with respect to functionality, especially when we're so limited in by ethical constraints on accessing functional information about single neurons from the human brain. So there's a lot of question as to whether the Connectome project is worth the kinds of resources that are being invested in it as opposed to other approaches. Um, I mean, I'm not going to weigh in on that uh, too much, but I will just stop by saying that you know, the Connectome projects will take, will take time. There are some really, really fantastic, smart people working on it and trying to improve the possibilities of what we can learn from it. But um, certainly, uh, connectomics is a really, I mean, it's not going to explain a lot of what we don't know about, um, about neuroscience. Uh, some of it will, will be helpful, we'll understand which parts of the brains are connected with each other, in what ways. Those connections are likely to be complicated. Individual specific, we'll have to think of how many individuals you need to, because we know that the brain changes structurally with learning so you know uh, you know you get the connectome of, of an individual who's been through a particular path in life and you don't have a sense of how much it's going to reveal with respect to humans more generally so uh, it'll be it'll be you know uh, worth seeing how many connectomes one will need to sort of get before one starts to uh, not require new information right before one starts to sort of uh, uh, encounter redundancy so these are all i think um, questions that need to be asked where at the stage of planning research and and the you know the diversion of resources to, to particular approaches and certainly i wouldn't want to be a, a grad student developing a connectome right because it's just sort of a lot of grant work i mean i know grad students who've done this right lots of grant work you're just looking at image after image after image uh you're you know putting sample after sample after sample into a scope now a lot of it's done by technicians but at one point there were a lot of students who put their effort into this and you know, you know that this is a project that's going to take a lot of work and it's going to be uh, arrive much, much later. So certainly it's an individual student's decision, but I wouldn't want to be that student, perhaps. I like to get my kicks out of my animals much quicker than that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Okay. So I will stop sharing my screen then. Um, yeah, if anyone else wants to ask questions, feel free. You can always write to me. I'm also looking for students who might be interested in doing electrophysiology work on the cricket system. So if you're interested in that, please get in touch. If you're interested in any research in the lab, also get in touch. Um, yeah, good interacting with all of you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so I much, Professor Bittu. Thank you. Niharika, you can take over. Yeah, just a sec. Yeah, I think he had a power cut. 
Oh, all right. So yeah, then because the light went off and then his signal was lost. So presumably the the light went first and then the internet soon after. Yeah, probably. So uh, firstly, I'd like to thank you, Professor Bittu, for uh, joining us and giving such an interesting session. It was really amazing. And yeah, people did enjoy the Q and A session also a lot. And it it was like it would be good if it never ended, but then we have to. So thank you so much for that. And secondly, I'd like to thank our audience for joining in for the conference. And with this, we come to the closing of day one for BioCon 2021. So thank you people for joining in.